and we're glad. And I wanted to, uh, to begin my message today by saying this is Valentine's Day, but I'm not here to lead a Valentine's celebration. However, I do have a message that is appropriate and suitable to the day. I, I, I got a little uh, interested, and in how, how did it start? You know, where did it come from? And uh, a lot of things that uh, the church does are, have their roots in uh, pagan festivals, and there may be some connection between Valentine's. There's a fertility cult in Rome that's thought to be uh, maybe had something to do with Valentine's Day. But the story that I like the best is that uh, St. Valentine uh, married some Christian soldiers. The king had forbid him to do it because he said a soldier is a better soldier if he doesn't have a, a wife. And I can understand that. You want to get back home to your family and to your wife. And he felt if you didn't have a wife, you would be a better soldier. So they beheaded St. Valentine. And that uh, is part of the roots. In about the fourth century, the church sought to Christianize this. And so we do have something to celebrate. We have a love to celebrate that the world doesn't even know about. As believers, there's a higher level of love that a Christian experiences, even in the family. Than, uh, than the world experiences. And so we celebrate our love today that God has given to us and our families that God has given to us as well. Only Christmas exceeds Valentine's Day as far as cards are concerned. And I've read this, this year the average person will spend $130 on gifts for Valentine's Day. And... Uh, the more girls you get in your family, the more gifts you got to buy. Because you, not only do you uh, get, have something for your wife, but you got to give something to the, the girls that have come along as well. And so uh, it gets to be costly. But the average, 130 bucks, billions of dollars worldwide spent this year. And I was thinking last week, I knew what I was preaching on this week. But uh, uh, Randy Ruaz had a marvelous message on love like you've never been hurt. And man, did it strike a chord. And it touched our hearts deeply. And it, it was just a great day. And I had, uh, when it dawned on me that we had an evangelist in the morning and a business meeting in the afternoon, my question, I said, Lord, can we still have revival and a business meeting in the same venue. And I learned Sunday morning, yes, he's still the same as he was on the day of Pentecost. What a great day. It was a, it was a marvelous day. And a great business meeting. We thank God for being with us and guiding us. And uh, we're, we are seeking to love and not let past hurts and all of this stuff dampen our love. And it was a great message. Today we celebrate love again. The love of Christ has for his church. And the love between a husband and wife or a husband and his family. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And I, I think in a, we live in a day where marriage needs to be honored. Amen? amen. That was a weak amen. amen. You better be getting more vocal and saying much, much louder. Yes, marriage is of God. It's the oldest institution in the Bible. And uh, Jesus has a word for husbands. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 where he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so the, the Lord talks to Paul, through Paul, talks to the husbands, has a word for us. Love your wives like uh, 
Christ loves a church. And I don't want to speak down and demean men today. I think there's far too much of that. We, we had a, a tremendous meeting with a, a, a large group of men last Saturday evening. And it was, it was refreshing just to be among those guys and to be a part of that. And we hope to do, do more. But I believe in men. I believe that the strength of the church is men. And uh, the beauty of the church is the women. But, uh, and they have a tremendous influence on what happens in the body of Christ. And I, I have been thinking, if we could mobilize every man and get them to uh, on fire for God, there's no telling what we could accomplish in this city. If we mobilized our men and had everyone at their place of, uh, of uh, service, I think the devil is in the place, in the sound system. Amen. He always goes there. What do you say? <laughs> That's right. We got the tech here, and he just cast him out. All right, we're in business. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, uh, this, let me just read a few of those verses to you. And don't get alarmed about it, but it's, it's what the Bible says. Christ is the head of the church. And he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water, with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should lo love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold first to his wife, fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is uh, profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right. Hallelujah. It's not cheap equipment. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to try to do this. I don't like to do it this way, but I'll do it. Things always go the way you want them to, do they? But anyway, Jesus has a word, and that's the message for everyone. For the believer... We need, and we'll find in this passage, what, how Christ loves the church, and he does. I have an article in my file, I was looking at it yesterday, and it's entitled, Demeaned and Devalued, and it's talking about the church, and how that the church has been ridiculed, criticized, uh, one or two bad eggs in the basket, and everybody is labeled, and it's uh, as being uh, out of touch with reality. You see, I've, I've been going to church for seven decades. I've never seen a day like this day. I've never gone to church expecting them to s order the service to suit me. I've always felt that we're there to suit the Lord. And not me, it's not my taste, it's not what I think, it's what he thinks. And I think that uh, the church has been devalued. It's not, it's an option today. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that we're living in one of the most perilous hours of the world. And the church is at its least, not its best. Did you know everywhere I read, they tell me, 85% of churches are de declining or closing. And uh, that means that 1.5 out of 10, less than 2 out of 10, 
are actually growing, and most of those are growing through transfer growth. Where Christians move from church to church, wherever the fire seems to be burning the brightest, that's where they go. And we live in that hour when the call is for the church to be at its best. And I believe that we're on the brink of moving into a new era of what God intends to do through this church in this city. And I don't want to stop and be aborted because of lack of strength to produce the child that needs to come forth. And so it's prayer, agonizing prayer, that will, will be a birthing prayer, that will bring forth what God desires in and for his church. So we believers need to be reminded, for the single person, if you're single this morning, you should be focusing on becoming the right mate. If you spent as much time trying to become the right mate as you do seeking the right mate, you would be light years ahead of the process. Because even if we find the right person and we're not right, we just mess it up. And so that's where we are. We're either looking and preparing ourselves or we are preparing ourselves and intending to stay single. If you can't commit yourself completely to a person and together be partners in the work of God and you're happy single, God bless you. You'll have less trouble. But you may be a little lonely. But the Lord handles that. You'll be happy and satisfied. So the, the single person needs to be becoming. And then those who are married, we can learn how to be a better mate. You know, this is a subject that in my 33 years I've rarely preached on. I'm going to tell you why now. Confession is good for the soul. Even though this year we will celebrate 57 years, I don't claim to be an authority on marriage. And I hesitate to speak about things that I personally feel unqualified to speak about. You say, well, when will you be qualified? Never. You're always qualifying. And so I've been very hesitant to tell other people, but I do believe this. Better Christian, better husband. Better Christian, better wife. Better Christian, better children. That if you put God's principles into practice, you will become what God wants you to be, and you will be a part of a loving family, a, a unit. And that takes many forms today. Loving like Jesus loves the church. There's some characteristics of his love. I want to just point out a couple of them to you. First of all, it's serving love. Christ's love for the church is a serving love. Notice in verse 23, which I didn't read for you, but it's just above the other, where the Bible teaches us that uh, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is, is himself its Savior. And then he goes on to say, so the husband is the head of the wife. For the husband, notice that, for, in verse 23. And you could write in your margin and not do an injustice. For often means because. Because the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior, Paul is writing these words to us. Because of that, the husband is the head, serving love. Jesus is the head of the church. What does that mean? Well, I, can, I could spend an entire session, but that's not my topic. But let me say these words. To be a head, headship, means that Jesus determines the direction of his church. And only Jesus has the right to do it. 
And if I am trying to lead the church, I'm best to know in my heart of hearts, this is what God wants to do in this church and to be about that business because Jesus is the head of the church. I'm not really the pastor. I'm the under-shepherd. Christ is actually the pastor of the church. The word pastor and shepherd synonymous. It is his church. He determines its direction and its vision. He is the head of a church. And Paul says it over, over and over in the book of Ephesians. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, this teaching is provided. For, as I've said, means because. This is the head of the church speaking to the church. And the husband who has been given headship over the wife, he's the head of the wife. And one way to show love to the wife is to be the spiritual leader of your home. In fact, I read this on Focus on the Family this week on one of their their uh, emails, and they said spiritual leadership in the home is at the top of your wife's list of love needs. And how many times over the past 45 years have I had wives sit in my office and say, if only my husband would be the leader of our family spiritually. But because he doesn't, she does, and that's the thing to do. If he doesn't, you must. But God has ordained that this divine order be set in the family. And the husband is the head. He has headship. And that means we lead humbly. One writer said, I've never met a woman who says, I'll resist my husband's leadership even though he is very humble and Christ-like. That never happens. The women I've uh, met are craving godly leadership in their marriages. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Divine order has been set, and God said it is not good that man should be alone. Remember those words? That it, it seems like Moses or Adam named all the, the animals that he had, God had created. And there was no help made suitable for him. So God put him to sleep. Took a rib out of his side and made Eve. Who, because he has bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, Adam said, she shall be called woman. I don't know if that's woe man. If that's what it means. But it means woman, right? She's the same species. She's not from a different planet. Now, there have been times over the course of years that I've wondered about that statement. Because someone said, I don't understand my wife. I said, well, I've been at it for almost 60 years now. And I don't know any more than I did when I started. I don't understand them any more than I used to understand them. They have a different perspective. They have a different viewpoint. But how many times has just the counsel of a wife, the words that she has spoken in love and in humility, kept me from making a horrible mistake? And thank God, it's just wisdom to listen to your partner sometimes. Not always. God said to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. That was after his wife, Sarah, had given him Hagar, the slave, to bear children. They thought God needed some help to get his will done. And he said, walk before me and be perfect. And we, we need to do that. The head of every man is the Lord, Jesus now, a lot of people don't know that. They think they belong to themselves. Not so. He's headship. I know a businessman must have read some of the things that I read about this headship business. One man said, 
It's like the husband is the CEO, the chief executive officer. But the wife is the chief operating officer. She's the COO. And it's good when you're on the same page. When you're loving one another and you have unity together in raising your children. That when one speaks, both of them are in it. And you're going to back up what she says and she's going to back up what you said. We may not agree with each other, but we'll talk about that in another setting. But we are together and we're going to be together because our kids are going to leave us. And many times people discover they're living with somebody they don't even know. And it's good to know. Peter said, dwell together with them with knowledge. The Living Bible says, don't be stupid. You know why Jesus said, love your wife? That's almost the only commandment that God gives a husband. Because the last thing we're most likely to do is to love them. I'm not going to get into this this morning. But every time I have uh, counseled with premarital counseling and talking to folks, now I'm, I'm so old now, I'm useless. We are a bunch of dummies. We, we don't know how to get in out of the rain. We haven't raised any kids or grandkids. We haven't had any influence. And it's different now. I said, you mean kids are being born differently than they used to be? I thought it's the same process. I didn't know it had changed. But no woman wants to be loved like a man. And no man wants to be loved like a woman. And what man thinks is love is usually pretty physical. And what women think is love is usually pretty kind, gentle, thoughtful, considerate. And uh, you, you have to learn how to love in this relationship. You say, what's that got to do with me? Well, you think you're spiritual. You don't have a wife. Spurgeon said, if I want to know how spiritual a man is, I don't ask him. I ask his wife. Because two people are put together with different kinds of viewpoints, different opinions to tool out and to help us to grow and become what God wants us to be. It's part of his process. And it's a great thing when it works. Secondly, sacrificial. He gave himself up for her. Jesus gave himself up for the church. It was the ultimate sacrifice. His body was broken. His blood was shed. And Jesus himself said, Greater love has no one than he who lays down his life for his friend. I've called you friends, and he died for us. We are called to deny ourselves. That's sacrificial. On Wednesday night, we're, we're now deep in the study of holiness. Not heard of much today. But there are two things that you'll find with holy. One is cleanliness. God cleans us up in order to be holy. And the other is the, his word and spirit in us. Men are called by God to lead our, their wives, but our leadership should be selfless. Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. New International Version. And that, that would solve most of our problems. In, in, that, in a marriage relationship. And thirdly, it's a satisfying love. He loves the church, verse 26 and 7, and gave himself up for, I've said that, so that we might sanctify. And I've added a so in brackets. That's my addition, but that's, that's what Paul is saying. He gave himself up for her so that he might be able to sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word. Do you know what sanctify is? 
It means to set apart to the Lord. It means that God has chosen us out, sanctified us. How am I chosen? Those who answer the gospel call are chosen. Those who say yes to salvation are chosen. And God sets us apart, sanctifies us unto himself. He sets us apart unto himself because the Bible says God has a deep desire to have a relationship and fellowship with his creation. And sin has separated us. Sin still separates us from God, from each other. And he begins to clean away the sin and to wash away that sin so that he has a people of his own. We belong to him, Paul says. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And he be we belong to Jesus. We are his. Jesus said in John, he's 15 and verse 3, he said, You are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. And he, that's how he cleanses us. By the washing of water of the word. Did you take your bath this morning? I'm talking about your spiritual bath. Did you spend as much time getting your heart ready to present to the Lord as you did your body? This morning to start in prayer and start in the word. And there's like taking a spiritual bath. And I'm saying, Lord, this is good. This is wonderful. I read those last two chapters in the book of Exodus 39 and 40. And here's what I think about when I read them. They built a house and then God moved in. It says the Shekinah glory settled on that tent. And God was saying, you built me a place and now I'm occupying the place you have built. And that's what we do. We make room for him in our life, in our schedule. We make room for God. And the greatest fellowship I ever know, and I love people. I don't like to be by myself. I like people. But my greatest fellowship is with him because he is such a wonderful Savior. And God always speaking something wonderful in our life. He satisfies us. You are clean, he said. My Bible says if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses us. And you read on and he says that we're to love the wife like our own family and nourish and cherish our, her as we do our body. Nourish means food. We feed them. We provide. You know what Paul said? I've heard people quote this so many times that a person, a believer that doesn't, a so-called believer that doesn't provide for his family if he can is worse than an infidel. We are providers. And it's important for us that word provide includes looking down the road and preparing for any eventuality. That's why we do the, the teaching on Wednesday night, Financial Peace University. It's to help people learn how to manage money because that's part of it. We're nourishing. We're providing food. Food for the family. Lord help us. Betty said to me last night, you're getting a belly on you. Well, when you keep buying cookies and a gallon of ice cream at the last visit to the store, Jesus, I can't handle that. And it's chocolate ice cream. And the other day, I was with Chris at, at uh, what is it, cookout. I started to say steakout, it's cookout. And uh, he said, they have the best milkshakes you've ever put in your mouth. 
And so I looked on the menu, and they had a double chocolate milkshake. I said, that's mine. Double chocolate. Once on the lips, forever on the hips. Or somewhere. <laughs> and I, I was, uh, I, I'm being weighed in to the doctor's office last week, and, and I'm up a few pounds, and I said, I haven't yet lost Thanksgiving and Christmas. The two of them together just about put me under. But I am going to. Because right now, i got three sets of clothes. Small, medium, and large. And right now, I'm pushing the large part. And I said, no, I'm not going to be like my brothers, my blood brothers. They look like they could deliver twins at any moment. <laughs> and I tell them every time I see them, when you guys going to deliver? You've been pregnant all this time. When I eat with them, I know why they're like that. But I eat just as much. But my dad, bless his heart, he could eat as much as he wanted to and never gained anything. I've been praying for those genes to jump up. So you could just eat it. But listen, you nourish. But I think how Christ nourishes the church. When you're hungry inside, and there's nothing in this world that can satisfy that hunger. And either the Holy Spirit drops a word into your heart, or you get in the Word of God and something jumps off the page, and you're thinking, that's exactly what I need today. That couldn't be more appropriate. And he nourishes his church. He feeds us. Oh, what a feeding the Lord has for us. He sets the table like this morning. He set it for us. Question is, will we leave our plate unattended? Or will we partake of what Christ has for us? He nourishes. And it also refers to clothing and external, cherishing and nourishing. God clothes us with spiritual clothes. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I've always loved that. I don't know how I got so long in my Christian life and in church with never finding Isaiah 61 and Luke 4.18 becoming really alive. God, God's word, it's a marvelous thing. God clothes us. He gives you the oil of joy for mourning. The spirit of praise for heaviness. That's what God does for you. He puts a smile on your face. He provides spiritual food and works in us to mold our lives into what it should be. You know, years and years in the church, we never knew Jehovah Jireh. We thought that was our job to provide for ourselves. But we've discovered he is the Lord who provides all our needs, and we can trust Him. When we love our wives as Christ loves the church, we give ourselves up for her, sacrificial, self-denying. And there's a sanctifying process for the marriage in which the husband and wife are drawn to Jesus and one another. It's amazing how God works. A husband full of God's word and loving like he should love will be able to speak that word in a timely manner and way into the lives of his family members. If she has a question, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, don't, let, don't speak out in the service and ask it. Ask your husband when you get home. We say, what if you don't have a husband? Ask a spiritual leader. That sets the right example. Had a pastor in Texas that had a whole group of, a whole clan of, of gypsies that moved in. And their custom was the women set one place and the husband set another. And during his service, he had to apply that scripture. Because the women setting over here would say to the husband over here, what is he talking about? What does he mean by that? And the scripture says the husband should be able to answer that. And if not, find an answer. 
He nourishes and cherishes. My objective is to never undermine the, the authority and the influence of a father in the home. Because the Lord says they are the head. And so when you have a marriage built on Jesus Christ in the center and the solid foundation of his word, it will not fail. It will not crumble. I joke when I say it's a life sentence. You didn't know what you was getting into when you got married, but you're there now. Make the best of it. I loved what our missionary said when we introduced his family. She's my partner in ministry. I, I, don't, I don't have time to think much. I'm thinking about the future, but sometimes I look back, and, and I've mentioned this before, but it bears mentioning it again. I said to Betty, I said, you remember when I announced to you that we'd be leaving Florida in February? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Have you ever left Florida for Maryland? In February? And the kids had never been there, and we were driving in, and there was a railroad crossing in the middle of town. And when a train was coming, a little guy would come out with a sign and a lantern, and it would say, stop, train. And we would stop. Finally, while we were there, they built a bridge, thank God. They said to me, where have you brought us? We want to go home. Seven years in sunny Florida has always been one of our favorite spots. And we had hoped someday to be back and could have, but never felt led to. Here we are. And I've made some life changing. I'll never forget walking in and telling Betty we had been in our new home about six or eight months and just saved up enough money to put furniture in the living room. And here's how I got that home. A, a builder in the church said, I've been watching your life. I didn't know this guy. But I've been watching your life, and I feel like that the Lord wants me to help you. And I'm building a new house. He told me where it was, and he said, I want you to have it, and whatever I have to do to make it happen, I will make it happen. That's how we got our new home. We've been in it, enjoying it, loving it. Furniture ready for the living room. And I came in one night, and I said, Betty, you better sit down, because I got some news for you. We're going to be moving. Moving? to Florida. Florida. I'd never been to Florida. What are you going to do? Well, I'm enrolling in Southeastern College to prepare to go into ministry. Now, she did what any good woman would do. She cried. <laughs> and I look back and I thought, you know, I, I was so dumb, I didn't know Take her a rose or something. I got a gift for you. Or give her a new ring or something. Of course, we were so poor we couldn't rub two nickels together. But we had the money for our furniture, and that's what we paid our tuition for the first year. Decisions. I know pastors' wives who are like dragging dead weight behind them. I've never had that to happen. Never. If it had have happened, I would have never been able to do some of the things that God has enabled us to do. It wouldn't have happened. But together, together. And you see, we believe in the church. We believe in the church. It's his body. And when you criticize the church, you're talking about his bride. And we need to be really careful. Do I believe in everything that's going on? No, but thank God he didn't call me to straighten everybody out. It grieves me, some of the things that I see. But listen, I'm going to keep my focus on Jesus. The man that builds his house upon the rock 
the man that builds on the word, the husband that loves him, his wife as himself, will be blessed of God. How can I love like Jesus? You can't in your own strength. The only way to love like Jesus is to have Jesus living inside of you. 1 Corinthians 13, which I haven't dealt with in a long time, in my opinion, is a portrait of Jesus Christ when it talks about love. You want to know what love is like? What's Jesus like? He's kind. Do you, have you ever, as I have, had to go to him for forgiveness as a believer and say, Lord, I don't know how these things happen, but I need to be forgiven. I have never had him turn his back on me. I've never had him say, sorry, son, you should know better. But I have felt his receptive spirit as he would put his arm around us and draw us in. God is a good God. This is his church. It's not my church. Divine order is a key thing in having a good spiritual Christian home. The second thing that you need is not only Christ in you, but you need Holy Spirit to empower you. And out of that order, divine blessings flow. I can think of a couple that's mentioned in this scripture, if you look at it. It bonds us together with an unbreakable bond. And unity grows out of that, out of love. I read the story of a lady who married a tyrannical husband, a generalissimo. He demanded that his wife conform to his rigid, rigid standards and whatever he chose. She was to do certain things for him as a wife, mother, and homemaker. In time, she came to hate her husband as much as she hated his list of rules and regulations. One day he died, mercifully as far as she was concerned. Sometime later she fell in love with another man and married him. She and her new husband lived in a perpetual, on a perpetual honeymoon. Her new husband was committed to her and her interest joyfully. She devoted herself to his happiness and welfare. And one day, she ran across the sheets of paper that her first husband had written down his demands. And as she looked at that sheet of paper, she went down the list and checked them off, and she was doing every single thing that he had demanded, though he had never made a demand. He loved her. She responded. It's easy to yield yourself to a man who loves you as his own flesh. And that's what God calls us to do. It's to love like Jesus loved. Now, Jesus said to the disciples, you are to love one another as I have loved you. The standard is always the same. The power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to love on a level that humanly is impossible is available to every single person. Would you stand with me? Good Lord, help us. I, need, I see why you're looking at me. So strange. I lost track. I can't see the clock. It's big letters, but I can't even see it. But anyway, I want to close this service with a prayer. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you, if, you're, if you are present here with your wife, if she's with you, or your husband, if it's you, I'm going to ask you to slip out in just a minute. Come here and stand together. I know probably the kids aren't with you, but if they are, you bring them with you. If you're a single parent, can I tell you, 
I was reading in 1 Timothy this week, 2 Timothy chapter 1. And Paul said to Timothy how much he missed him and how much he remembered his tears. And he said, I'm certain that the faith was in, that was in your grandmother and also in your mother is also in you. And what I've witnessed over the years, I've seen time after time as well as in Scripture, that's been mentioned. His father was a Greek. As far as we know, he was not even a believer. We don't know. But this we do know. Mom had a 